Welcome to Believe in the Bizarre, where we dive into the unknown and the unusual and tell you whether or not we find it believable. That is right. Guys, this is this is new here. This is new. We are diving into listener submission stories. Thank you for all the follows and talking to us. I can't believe how well it's going so far. Yeah, I, di- I just really want to say you all are so incredibly kind. Like we've been doing our best to try and reach out and communicate with the majority of people that start following subscribing and everything on social media and the amount of support we're receiving the amount of people that are sharing our stuff it it really means a lot to us and we see it all and we appreciate it so follow us now as we begin our first personal story submission the great dismal swamp mystery Okay, so this story was submitted to us by William. This takes place in Suffolk, Virginia at, as you could probably guess by the name, the Great Dismal Swamp Wildlife Refuge. Yeah, okay, so you're taking me down the hand on the hand here because I have no idea what's going on. Yeah, that's true. So the way I guess we should say this, it, it, first of all, if you speak to us ever on social media you are either talking to charlie and i there's there's probably no... tyler honestly <laughs> there's yeah i do most of the reaching out and charlie does most of the production but we do split up the work and and the content load so while i'm presenting this story the next submission that we are going to embark on and make into a story it's going to be presented by charlie so that way there there's always a sense of because you guys don't know the story so the other one of us is kind of playing that role of not knowing what's coming up next to kind of spark genuine conversation. Absolutely, because without conversation, what is this? Nothing. Exactly. Right. So, Suffolk, Virginia, Dismal Swamp Wildlife Reserve. It's I, called Dismal Swamp? Yeah. It sounds like an insult. It kind it was, kind oh, of. okay, it's, good. It's not looked upon fondly. It's a swamp, and it, it kind of has creepy auras to it. It's over 107,000 acres of forested wetlands with a 3,000 acre lake, Lake Drummond, like Andre Drummond, like on the cats. I don't know. That's fine. They don't know. either. So there's three parts to the story that we're going to get into. There's the sounds. There's this first encounter. And there's a second encounter. Now, I want to shout William out. First of all, you're our very first submitted story. So thank you. And second... He had a lot of really good stories that he sent. I kind of took the ones that kind of made a succinct story, like one narrative. So that's what we're going to go with, the swamp. But I, I just want to thank you, William, for sending all their stories because they were really entertaining. And you could probably start your own podcast and do well because <laughs> they were really good. So you're saying, is William an untapped source? And like, are we going to come back to anything else? Or? Very potentially. All right. But today we are talking about the Dismal Swamp Wildlife Reserve. So let's start with the sounds, okay? Okay. Where William lives on the Dismal Swamp Wildlife Reserve is- Oh, he lives there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Shoot. Very, not like inside. You know, he has a house. His (laughs) his father actually built the house- Really? uh, With his own hands. Because he told me a paranormal story, but he said that it wasn't like nobody died in the house because his father built that house. So they live in a house on a very secluded area. And when it comes to the sounds that he hears coming from the forest- It can't be, he doesn't hear the hustle and bustle of a suburb or a city. His nearest neighbor is half a mile away. So he's, he's pretty alone out there. So being near the wildlife reserve and away from people, he gets used to hearing a lot of different noises. Like I said, instead of cars and sirens, he hears birds and barn owls and mountain lions and coyotes and frogs and such. However, he details that there are a few sounds that he hears, and even his father hears, that are very unusual. Oh, okay. All right. So I'm hooked right now. Like, I'm hooked in. Good. Okay. When William was younger, he had a hot tub in his backyard that he would... Yeah, yeah, I know, Sam. That he would like to lay in, and he'd like to just lay out there and listen. Because he made a point to reference that just the sounds 
are just crazy. Like even outside the paranormal, I'm sure just the sounds that you would hear of the animals and the insects and everything probably kind of sounds amazing. Probably after living there for so long, it would drown out a little bit. But he also has a deck. He has a shooting stand because he here's like a gun range on his property, which will get back to the shooting stand or the deer stand as he calls it. But he likes to listen to the surrounding forest. So some of the unusual things that he hears, he hears people screaming, he hears shouting, he hears voices, and he also hears babies crying. In, in the forest? In the forest. Now, Not on TV. Not on TV, no. Oh my God. While he's outside listening in the forest. And he says that out of all the noises he hears, the most frequent thing is the babies crying. And he said he brought it to his father's attention and it, it, he got the same reaction as if you were to say, oh, did you see that owl? His father's like, yeah, I hear it. It's just like, I mean, like... Whoa, what, okay, like, pause. His dad's like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, next subject. Are you kidding me? That's I don't, crazy. I don't think... I think it's just kind of like when you hear something so much... It's when you become numb to it. Like, I'm, I imagine if you live in a haunted house, like if you have a guest over, they might see a cupboard open. And, you know, you living there for so many years, you might just be like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that, that, that's the ghost. That's that old joke. That's that old joke. You're like, oh, oh boo, boo, whatever. Right. Now, he told the story very humbly. And he did say, you know, it could be his imagination. And he understands that coyotes and mountain lions do make weird noises. They do make shrieking noises. He understands that there are animals that make creepy noises. But he can't explain or shake the feeling of the crying baby sounds coming from the woods. Now, as if hearing voices and babies crying weren't creepy enough, this is absolutely crazy to me. He claims that he hears his name called out from the forest. And not only does he hear his name being called out to him, it takes on the voice of his sister and his father. But it, it's crazy because his sister doesn't even live there. So he, so every, and he said this is infrequent. Like where the babies, he hears that a lot. It's not in every night or every day or, or probably every month thing where he hears his own voice. But it, he says like when he, either he's out on his deck or anywhere outside, sometimes he will occasionally hear what sounds like a family member call his name out. Did he say it was like, if it, is it always nighttime or is it during the day too? He didn't specify. I imagine oh. that it would be night, but maybe not. Who? I mean, a forest is a forest. It can be creepy even during like, kind of like a cloudy day. Dude, I am getting full body chills right now. Like, oh. So that's the first part of the story. Oh, the, we're, the just, noises. we're just dipping a toe in. Yeah. So <sighs> there, there's two encounters. You can kind of consider them a little bit separate from the noises, but at the same time, this is encapsulating his stories with this wildlife refuge so encounter one as i mentioned williams family owns a gun club on their property he that's said very cool he said it's about a 200 meter shooting range that's very cool on their shooting range they have a building which they call the shooting shack sure and on top of the shooting shack is a 14 foot high deer stand i imagine i don't hunt but i imagine that's you go up there to to you know scout out you know, I got a Shake Shack by me. A Shake Shack? Yeah, it's very delicious. Okay, good. <laughs> so one night, he was up on the deer stand when William saw a figure in the shadows about 50 feet away. Did he shoot it? It was an estimate. Not yet. Okay. And think context. Again, I, I'm, I'm always trying to bring context to the story. He's thinking deer, coyote. Mm -hmm. Like, you guys know you're listening to a paranormal podcast, so your mind's racing. Him. And although, I mean, creepy stuff obviously happens here, but imagine if you were out at night and you saw something walking off. Ah, like, oh, man, that looks like a deer. There's a lot of deer by me. That's what I would assume it was. So, you know, he's going, oh, whatever. There's, some, there's something out there. I wonder what it is. But then one of his dogs start barking. He's got two dogs. They're both English Mastiff Rottweilers. One of them's named Apollo. Oh, really? Yeah. Same Z's. I know, it's Charles. So it starts growling at what he assumes is the deer. And he's like, oh, you know, that's, that's weird. You know, I should, I'm, he's, so he's looking at the animal in the distance. And then his second dog starts barking. So there's like a growling that's just kind of growing louder and louder with his dogs. And then, unexplicably, the shadow animal notices William, his two dogs, and the growling. And the animal gets up on its hind legs, and it starts running. 
it runs into a dense group of bushes and it climbs to the top of this tree. In this thicket of bushes, there is one lone tree with this thing at the top of it. So William and his two dogs are by the deer, the 14 foot high deer stand, looking at this thing at the top of a tree, looking back at them. Now they can't, you can't identify it. It's, it's, it's night. There's a shadow up in a tree. So it's kind of like this staring duel. And William, I mean, he, like, what do you do? So he does what I think most people do. You call your father. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. So William calls for his father to come out. And so now he sees it too. Oh my God. So he sees something is in this tree and it's too dark to identify, but they know something is up there. So he, they go in and they, they grab a handgun. Well, his dad, his dad runs into the house and grabs a handgun and brings it back. Do you know, do you know what kind? I don't. He okay. might've said it and I might've skimmed over that. <laughs> it's like you, might yeah, you know, I, I'm almost positive. He probably said it. Okay. So just picture a handgun. Yep. That's it. Yep. Good job. <laughs> So he gives his his dad gives him a handgun and he says, "Take a shot at it." I feel like his dad is a character, and I mean that in, in the coolest way possible. Because somebody who's like, "Yeah, they're just babies crying in the forest," and then is like, "Here, take a shot at it." Yeah, I'd like to. I feel like I'd like to meet his dad. I feel like I do too. So William was a little surprised at first that you know his father was just like, "Yeah, shoot it," but then he's kind of like, you know, okay. So he takes a shot. He takes one shot at the creature in the tree, and he doesn't know if he hits it. He doesn't know if he hits the tree, but whatever happens after he squeezed off that shot, whether it be the noise or the, it actually hitting it or the tree, the creature fell out of the tree and then it scampered off into the forest. Oh man. Bipedally. Ah, man, that had to be, I hope that was a silver bullet. Probably not. No, I don't think so, but Jesus Christ. So the second encounter takes place about a year after the shoot shack incident that we just covered. Okay, so a year later. A year later. So William's inside his house when again he hears his dogs barking and growling at something in his backyard. Have we thought maybe the dogs are defective? Or... <laughs> well, clearly not. They alerted him correctly to yeah. whatever it was last time. You're right, you're right. I think the dogs are just fine. So this time, and I, I don't, he didn't really give me his frame of mind here. But I imagine with it being a full year later, the dogs barked before. I don't think he's instantly thinking. Oh, yeah. Creature. Probably not. Apollo's constantly on edge. His my Apollo dog. is too. My dog. But he does take a gun. Sure. Because I think at this point, he's just, you know, all precautions aside. And I think after you have an experience where you have to run inside and get your gun, probably for a while after that, you kind of prepare. Plus being that secluded, you know, I would get the, the heebie-jeebies. So he has his handgun with him. And he walks out to his backyard and he's, he explains that there is a, a big, massive floodlight in his backyard. So this massive floodlight, it, it illuminates his backyard for the most part. Now, there are like trees, there's brushes, there's there's areas that aren't illuminated. But for the most part, with this floodlight, he can see what's going on in his backyard. Despite being able to see the majority of it, there's this brush back there that is super thick and it's high enough like the the grass or the trees or the bushes, whatever, you know, what have you, is high enough that you can't really see inside. It's thick. So he's trying to calm his dogs down when he hears something rustling in the brush. And he looks at it, and the brush is about 10 feet high. And whatever is looking at him, peeking through the brush, is almost at the top. It's almost, it's over 10 feet high? Technically, it would be under because the brush is about 10. So I'm assuming this is about 8 feet. And not only is it peaking, but it's like peeling peeling the brush. So it's like taking two hands to separate whatever's in front of him, you know, vegetation-wise, to stare at William and the two dogs. And so he says it's too dark out, even with the floodlight, to get a great look at what it is because it's in a very dark area. But he claims it was very humanoidish, you know, very black, covered in shadows, incredibly tall, but humanoid-ish, about eight feet high. Dude, you need to move to the city. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So William said at this point, he said, you know, fine, I'm not doing this. And I think that was his polite way of saying, F- it. He pulls his gun out and he fires two shots directly at it. 
Now, he, he admits very humbly that it, with it being a different handgun than he's used to, he's, he's not the best shot. Not a horrible shot, but not the best shot. So he didn't kill it. He didn't kill it. He didn't get to examine what it was. It did scamper off. And his dogs tried to chase after it. But thankfully, I think for his dog's health, he was able to stop him. And that is the second encounter. Oh, my gosh. Wow. So let's go back to the sounds, right? Yes. What sounds like babies crying? There are these birds called gray cat birds. Now they spend their winters in Mexico, Central America. You know, they fly south as most birds do. However, during the months, April to May, you know, that time, they come back up. They can make their way all the way up to Michigan. So we can play a sound if you want to hear it right now. So not exactly like what you might imagine a baby crying off in the distance, but they do kind of give some semblance of a baby crying. Not quite indigenous to this forest, but it's an option. Now, and if you search, you know, what animals sound like a baby crying, this one wasn't very believable to me based on the sound bites that I heard, but people do claim that bobcats... can sound like a baby crying i heard more like a woman shrieking yeah I, I think that's probably been classified as well that's probably the majority that i could find for specifically the baby crying where are your thoughts at with that baby crying i don't know lots of things sound like things especially if it's like dark you can't see it i'm not saying he didn't hear what he heard but it could be chopped up to other things Okay, so let's move on to the voices. This is assuming that it's not his imagination, which he admitted that there, like, it absolutely could be. Like, he was very honest in his opinion that maybe, you know, imagination's getting the best of him. But let's pretend for a second it's 100% true. Creatures that are theorized to mimic voices include skinwalkers, flesh gates, crocata, demons, and wendigo. Uh, I was I was thinking Skinwalker the whole time. Yes, Skinwalker, which are a Navajo legend. They're basically evil witches. They do ritualistic, terrible things, sacrifice, incest, slaughter, and they get the ability to disguise themselves as animals. Typically southwestern, but stories have kind of moved their way south into the northeast. Maybe because it, it's gained prominence, but there are stories that pop up. So it, it is an option. Now the Wendigo. Wendigo is a creature that was once human, but is transformed into a moral evil spirit when it takes up the practice of cannibalism. However, this is more northern lore, like yeah, Minnesota, like up to like, Canada. Uh, Canada, even. yes, yeah. it's 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 way more northern. And the Krakata, I don't know a ton about that. It was in an episode of Supernatural, which I know you watch. I don't watch. <laughs> I haven't seen. But it's, I don't know. Apparently, it's it's a mythical dog wolf. And it has the ability to mimic voices. There was nothing I could see based on where it is. My instinct, just based on hearing his story, I was landing between Bigfoot, creature, I don't want to say like the Bigfoot, like the Bigfoot, but like the idea of a large humanoid uh, primate. Large humanoid primate or skinwalker. Those are the two that I was battling between. To me, this story screams skinwalker. Skinwalker. That's what it sounds like to me. I mean, running on hind, it could take an animal, could have been a wolf, could it could have taken on the form of a coyote, and then it ran away and climbed up a tree, and they do mimic voices. I mean, they yeah. can they can trick people and put them in a trance to lead them off to kill them. That is part of the lore. Yeah. I, uh, oh, oh, I'm getting shivers. I, I was feeling Bigfoot until uh, the voices part because I, I heard the story it was kind of the way that I was told the story isn't exactly the the uh, sequence of telling it isn't exactly the same so I heard about the deer stand before the voices okay so when I was when I re- hearing about the deer stand incident with it climbing the tree I was thinking man could this be a Bigfoot I didn't really hear about Bigfoot being able to climb trees and but then when the voices came in I agree it was kind of like this could be lending itself to a skinwalker oh but the, the thing from like fours to bipedal that's what freaks me out the most 
All right, well, then let me bring you back to Earth for a second. Okay. So one of the animals that the swamp apparently is known for, the entire swamp, not just his specific section of sure. it. It's a big swamp, you know. So, yeah. Is the black bear. And the black bear can walk on fours. It can walk bipedal. It can sprint up to 35 miles per hour. And did you know that a black bear can climb a 100-foot tree in 30 seconds? So that could describe it walking on fours, it getting on two feet, and it climbing a tree. Do black bears run 35 miles an hour on two feet? Well, it doesn't say... He didn't really say how far away the tree was from... Like, when it when it heard the dogs growling, and then yeah. it stood up and ran, I don't know the distance that it ran. But I'm telling you right now, I don't think a black bear is going to naturally run bipedally. <laughs> you know, it probably is going to gallop. Yeah, I don't... That That's... That's weird to me. I'm just trying to I'm trying to bring this back to Earth a little bit. I understand bit. what you're saying and how it kind of makes sense. So you don't buy it? No. Okay. But you can see where it's coming from. Yes, I, I understand the logic of it. But the sequence of events, if you had said it started by Peter Lee and went to all fours, I could absolutely see that. But because it was reversed, that doesn't pass the smell. Okay. So here's the last little bit that we'll get into. Is there anything that Suffolk, Virginia is known for? And yes, but not relevant. So there is a ghost story that is actually known to the area. The, the, I mean, the whole swamp is known to be creepy. Like, that's why it's, it's called dismal. There is an English writer, Charles Frederick Stansberg, that described the swamp as, quote, a place in which the imagination can play tricks on the victim, unquote. So it's kind of known for being eerie and creepy. And so there's a legend. That if you go into the Great Dismal Swamp late at night, you'll see the image of a woman paddling a white canoe on the lake looking for her lover. Oh. And it's based on this Indian maiden that died before her wedding day, so therefore she's looking for her groom. Is she eight foot tall? No. And oh, okay. But she might be crying. Yeah. So there is an explanation, though, that people are kind of coming to for the, for the ghost story specifically. Apparently there's sightings of foxfire which is like a glowing fungi in the swamp and it, it causes gases to drift up into the air and these gases could be mistaken for spirits and ghosts so that i don't want to say it's been debunked because you're using you know fungi to to kind of explain it i'm just saying that there are some realistic explanations for why people see that story but i wasn't able to find anything that matches william's personal stories nobody else is reporting seeing bigfoot like creatures or if they are, I didn't stumble upon it. So I just want to separate the Suffolk, Virginia's popular lore from the personal story that we're getting from William. So what do you think? We're, I mean, first of all, we're going to be as thoughtful as we can. If you send us a story and we put it on the podcast, we're not going to make you look stupid. We're not going to say, that was unbelievable. What a dumb story. <laughs> Everybody unfollow them. Right. No, that's not, what we're, that's not what we're about. You just want to look at your stories critically with maybe another opinion. Right. And in the most polite way possible. Absolutely. And it's easier to say because I think there's a lot of weight to this story right now. Yes. I, tr I, I try to get the sounds, the mimics, you know, the animals. But you bring up a really good point that I wasn't thinking about before. The black bear probably wouldn't sprint on two feet. It probably would gallop on all four. Yeah, absolutely. That's That would be that would be more natural for that animal. I think the creepiest part of the story is the voices and the crying. But I think that's also potentially the most unreliable part. Because I think, I think your imagination could take animal. I've heard animal noises before, where it just you know you freak out, and but you know somebody who is you know a little bit more hip to the sound might be like, that's ah, a deer or something. You know what I mean? Deer sound pretty freaky late at night. So I think the sounds are a little bit more unreliable, as even he said himself. But you bring a really good point. I mean, this thing's eight feet tall or higher. Using hands to open up and peer at him yeah for me the stalking of him at his house is what freaks me out the most mm. that's that's the thing that makes me feel like this is not of this earth or at least paranormal yeah paranormal do you want to look at it through the lens of do we find this story believable in terms of there's something paranormal lurking 
in the woods by his house. Yeah, instead of, like, giving it an actual name? Well, I, I guess I just mean... Well, do you want to be like, do you think this is Skinwalker? Believable, viable, skeptical? I don't want to put it down, because I don't know. Exactly. And, and if this story was only the voices that you hear, I probably would be a little bit more skeptical. Yeah. Or at least use probable cause occam's razor it's a bird but i think there's too many things that don't line up naturally for the stalking and i, I i'm using the phrase they use stalking yeah. him, or at least creeping around the forest so i think in terms of something paranormal i'm going to give this a believable for me william i think this is a believable because looking at you through the bushes and then the the opposite bear thing, running bipedally, it, it just, oh, oh, God, it screams wrong to me. So that's two believables from us, which makes this 100% believable. Yeah. So thank you, William, for sending us your story. He, he sent it to our email. He sent it audio. If you guys want to write us a story, that's fine. However you want to get the story to us, I would appreciate sending it to us at believingthebazaar at gmail.com. Our Instagram inbox is a little full. <laughs> That's true. So if you could email your story to us, we would love to have them. As as long as we keep getting those stories from you guys, we're going to keep doing these extra bonus episodes. They're fun. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a couple couple lined up. Um, I'm excited to get through them. I'm mean, not because like, I want to get through them, but because I want to talk about them. Again, we really appreciate the support, the kindness, the willingness to listen and share. You all have been absolutely fantastic, and it just keeps motivating us to keep doing better more researched and topical stories and episodes so thank you guys so much i am tyler and i'm charlie and until then join us on our next episode of believing the bizarre